thank you all for leading us in a time of worship and singing. And I not only appreciate the time that you spent here, but the time you spend beforehand. Uh, and a lot of time of preparation as well. So thank you for what you invest in that. By the way, that last song uh, comes directly from the passage we're going to be looking at this morning. And I'm going to just read through it and see if you can spot uh, where the words of that song come from in this passage. From Philippians 3, verses 1 through 11. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I have myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I consider them loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from faith from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Uh, <clears throat> we are going through, if you go to that first uh, slide there, um, just the title page. Um, it's about, uh, I, I like the book of Philippians. And if you ever just want to be encouraged and you're not sure what to read from the Bible, just head to Philippians. You're bound to be encouraged. And Paul, in the uh, first couple of chapters of Philippians, you can see him in kind of a parent role. Uh, this parent role, uh, the reason he does that is because they were his babies in the faith. The first church in Europe, the first European Christians, Lydia, the first European Christian, and uh, like a parent from a distance, he's having this letter written, and he says, you, know, you all get along with each other, you be good to each other, be unified, and so on, and uh, just shine like stars. I, I, I want to be proud of you, and just be like Jesus. That kind of summarized Philippians 1 and 2. Okay. Now he kind of continues in this parent role as he goes on into what we see as chapter 3 in the first couple of verses, a first verse, if you would go to that. Um, Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. He's changing a little bit, and instead of saying, you all get along, you be good, he's saying, I want you to have joy. If you're following along in the outline, that's that first blank there. He just wants them to have pure joy. That You, you know what joy is. Well, it's kind of like this. Happiness, if you have grown children and you invite them to your home, you think, okay, what's their favorite food to make? Um, what favorite games do they like to play? We're going to make it enjoyable for them. We're gonna, we want them to be happy. Okay, that's happy. Where you're just creating an occasion for them to be happy. Joy is solid. Even if you're not eating your favorite meal. Even if you're playing a game, well, okay, I'll do play your silly game. Okay, your game, all right. I still have joy. 
I know who I am. I know where life is going. I know where it's going to be in the end. I have peace and security. That's joy. Paul wants them to have joy. But now, like a parent, notice what he says, the second part of verse 1. It's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. It is a safeguard for you. Uh, he wants to put his protective arms around them because he knows there are some people that are joy suckers. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, okay. Uh, let's just go to the mall. We're not going to stay here, okay? In the mall, you see somebody you know, but you know them enough so that when you visit with them, at the end of your conversation, you're going to be exhausted. They just suck all the energy out of you. The joy suck. Okay? Paul says, there's joy suckers that are going to take away your joy. Well, who is this? Well, we continue on in verse 2. Watch out for those dogs, he calls them. <laughs> He calls them evil viewers, mutilators of the flesh. What's he talking about here? Well, let me tell you, I don't know how well you know your early church history. Something I didn't know till I was in going to seminary training to be a pastor. In the early church, for the first couple of centuries, there were Jewish synagogues that were actually part of the church. You had these Jewish settlements were uniquely Jewish synagogues, but also Christian. Uh, these Jewish synagogues would still do all the Jewish things. Circumcision, eating kosher food, uh, dressing, worshiping on Saturday, the Sabbath, but also getting up early Sunday morning to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and worship them too. They were totally Jewish, totally Christian. Uh, the closest we have to that today is the Messianic view. Okay. Nothing wrong with having a group of people that want to follow all the Old Testament. Nothing wrong with it. Problem comes in when they start saying to the rest of the Christians, you've got to do what we do. You've got to make sure you're circumcised your boys on the eighth day. Make sure you eat the right food, dress the right way, do your bar mitzvah, do your Hanukkah, etc., etc., etc. Do everything just right, as Moses said. Paul says, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now you're starting to suck the joy out of being a believer. It's, you no longer have the joy of belonging to God. <laughs> Which makes me wonder, it, is there anything I do or say that sucks out your joy? Anything else a church or others may do to suck out our joy? But there's another problem with that. Paul mentions that, uh, and in just a little bit, he, he calls it, a, well, verse 3, we have, okay, yeah, we have that. <laughs> Is we who are the true circumcision created by God both? Okay. No confidence in the flesh. Uh, confidence in the flesh is saying, look what I'm doing. Do you notice this? I'm doing pretty good, ain't I? That's confidence in the flesh so that God is even impressed. That's confidence in the flesh. Okay, now Paul is going to do something very interesting. Um, he's going to do a little bit of a comparison game. You know the comparison game? I used to do this myself. Uh, the comparison game is, oh, 
so you've traveled to other countries, huh? Um, so you've traveled to Mexico, okay, to Canada, okay. Yeah, but Bob and I went to Europe. <laughs> we went to Macedonia. You've been to Macedonia? Lake <laughs> Ochrid? Yeah, I've been there. The trouble is, as soon as I say that, you're going to tell me what countries you've been at. <laughs> you think you're so big. All right. Comparison game. Uh, by the way, I've seen pastors do that too. How much they want to know how many are going to your worship service? Or, or better yet, how many campuses do you have? <laughs> you say you have three campuses? <laughs> Well, we're looking on our eighth campus, okay. Comparison game. Now, what Paul is going to do is this. He says, okay, I'm going to play your silly comparison game. Let, I'll, I'm just going to play along for a little bit. Here's we go on to verse 5. Uh, he says, uh, let me get it here. <clears throat> oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Verses five and six. Here's, here's, here's his brag list. Circumcised on the eighth day. Even as a baby, he was good. Are you impressed? His parents did everything just right. <laughs> All right. Of the people of Israel, I can document that I'm a descendant all the way back to Abraham. Of the tribe of Benjamin, not only an Israelite, but a Jew. Benjamin and Judah were combined together as the Jewish people. I can trace my ancestry, he says, all the way back to Benjamin. For Jews, that was important. A Hebrew of Hebrews. Look at my ancestry, he says. Every one, no outsiders, purebred Jew, purebred Hebrew. Let's see how many of you can say that. In regard to the law, a Pharisee. In other words, if there's a group of people in the religious establishment that does the best for keeping the law, Pharisees have it hands down. One of them, says Paul. And by the way, he's dictating this to Timothy. <laughs> you can almost see Paul swaggering here a little bit, just <laughs> kind of, all right. As for zeal, persecuting the church, I'm going to make sure all the riffraff is out. You just a little bit deviating from the real truth, out you go. That's what I did. And as far as righteousness based on the law, faultless. How many hundred laws are there in the Old Testament? Pick any one. I did it. And I did it well. That's Paul's brag list. He's saying, you're wanting to play this comparison game, who's the most religious? <laughs> I got you beat, hands down. Even God's got to be impressed. Confidence in the flesh. I can do it in my own strength. Okay. By the way, have you ever gone that route yourself? I'm <laughs> Sadly, I've done that. Going to a seminary in which... Um, in our tradition, we really just had to learn the basic truth. We had to know our Bible inside out, high school too. And I go to seminary and all these students say, whoa, John, you know your Bible. Okay, all right. Yes, I do. <laughs> all right. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and by the way, talking about Sabbath, Sabbatarian, uh, these others claim to be Sabbatarians. They're keeping the Sabbath. That means on Sunday you don't work and don't do extra things. I, there was not another student that was stricter than me. I never through college and seminary studied on Sunday. I just wanted one day of rest. 
Nobody else. There was only one other person that I ever met in my life that was a stronger set than me. I didn't even make long distance phone calls on Sunday. At that time, you still needed to use the operator. <laughs> and I'm making somebody work. Uh, how many of you can say that? <laughs> All right. And I could go on. The brag list. Now, now things get really interesting. Because Paul is saying, look at my brag list. You may be intimidated as you look at it. But let me tell you how I look at my brag list. Verse 7. Verses 7 and 8, you'll notice a repetition here. Whatever was, were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared with the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Let me pick up on that one word, garbage. Um, any of you who can read Greek, you'll know that that's a tame translation. It's, it includes garbage, but his focus is more on, I think it's a blank here. Yeah, manure, manure. Um, you non-farm folk, that's animal poop. <laughs> manure. I look in my brag list. It's repulsive to me. It makes me gag. It stinks. That's what he's saying about his brag list. But also notice what he says in these verses. He, all of these gains that I thought were great are a loss. Everything's a loss. I've lost all these things. You, you see, the, the, this word loss actually kind of means worthless. Immediately, I think of my college textbooks. I don't know what uh, is done for textbooks in college nowadays, but back then, you had to buy these big, thick textbooks. You had to pay big bucks for those things. Man, those things were expensive. So when you graduate from college, there's no way you're just going to dump those in the trash. They're too valuable. And so you look at them once in a while. But after a number of years, you say, oh, I don't need them anymore, and you sell them. Have you ever tried to sell college textbooks? Nobody will pay a nickel for them. They are literally worthless. That's what Paul is saying. My brag list is worthless. In fact, it could even hurt me before God. It could actually drive me away from God because it reinforces Satan's lie. You can be godlike without God. You really don't need God. That's all the brag list does is to reinforce Satan's lie. Well, well, well. Well, if you're not going to put a lot of work in, into being a good person and trying the best you can, how in the world are you going to turn out to be a religious, decent person? If you're not really working hard at it. And this is where Paul says, this is how, this is how I got it. Verse 9. Talking about that I may gain Christ and be found in Christ, not having a righteousness or goodness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness or goodness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Do you get this? If you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, you know that he died on the cross for you that he took away your sin to bring you back to God. But a whole lot more. Because he says, I'm not going to only take away your bad. I'm going to give you my good. 
all the goodness I have in the deity, in my perfection, perfect image of the Father, I'm going to share it with you. I make you good. You don't. I do. That's how we become good. You see, being a believer changes everything. You know that somebody's in control and it's not the government. You know that there is a purpose through history and that the end is good. You know that you have dignity as a child of God, as an adopted child of God. All of this. But also, look inside. Look at the work that Christ is doing on the inside. It's beautiful. And how do you get this? You just open your arms and your heart and receive the free gifts of God. That's what Paul is wanting. And he says to the Philippians, these joy suckers are wanting to take that all away from you. Don't go there. Just embrace Christ and keep following him. Okay. Now there's a little bit more that Paul adds to this. And this is where we look in verse 10. He says, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. You want this joy that Paul has, says about joy in the Lord? He says, just walk in the footsteps of Jesus. If I get to know you and I get to know your career, one of the things I like to ask whatever career you have is, what kind of training did you need that for that? What, what are the steps to become a CPA or whatever, or a computer programmer? Whatever it is, what are the steps to become that way? Um, once in a while, I'm asked what would be involved in becoming a pastor. Especially if I encourage somebody to become a pastor, they say, okay, what's involved? I say, okay, here are the steps. At least in our tradition, you need to go to college. You need to go to seminary. Um, you're going to need some practice. Um, you're going to need an internship, perhaps. You're going to need, uh, uh, and you're going to be examined. You're going to be checked out. I say, here are the steps. You want to become a Christian? Here's the steps. Embrace Jesus and just start following him, walking in his steps. Becoming like your Lord Jesus, loving the unlovable, wanting to forgive people that are assaulting you, wanting to give and give and give to others. Sharing the good news of the kingdom of God. Just walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Not easy. But boy, that's the path of joy. Because he says, as he continues in verse 11, um, becoming like his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. Walk in the path of Jesus, no matter how hard it is to be the presence of Jesus in this world. <laughs> and it's held before you, the joy of his resurrection in which you will share. I think that's a blank in the outline. Share in his joy and resurrection. Joy, joy, joy. So a good question that I have to ask myself and I would like to ask you. Are you headed in that direction? 
Back to seminary days, I worked part-time as a security guard, and for a while I worked at a nightclub as a security guard. And uh, one of the bouncers of that nightclub was going to law school. And we were talking once, one time, and I said to him, do you have any goals in life? He says, yes, one goal, to become a millionaire. And at that time, the millionaire was, whoo, that's a long ways to go. He probably did. He was very driven. Uh, he was a bit older than me, and I wonder if he's still living. I don't think so, because his lifestyle at that time wasn't very healthy. So let's just say he's passed away and there's a funeral. What do you think they would say at his funeral, his, the eulogy? Would they be impressed with him being a millionaire? Is that what you do a eulogy on? Uh -uh. It's how you related to people. How kind you were, what your character was, what kind of person you were, what drove you. What, that's the thing you say. And it makes me wonder, what are they going to say at my eulogy? What do you think they'll say at yours? You know what's more important than what they say at your funeral? It's what God would say. If God were to say, this was my child, he was united to my son Jesus, and he walked in the footsteps of Jesus, becoming more like my son, that is what I would want to hear from my living God. We're reminded in this passage of what's really important. What is important? Your brag list? Uh -uh. <laughs> That's not important. What's really important is that you have joy in the Lord Jesus Christ as you walk in his footsteps. That is where we find our joy. Let us pray. We thank you for reminding us, Father, through this passage of where we find our joy. We pray that you will unite us to your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you will give us the courage to follow him in his footsteps. And we pray that you would give us your joy that only you can give. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.